Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to take a close look at this fairly typical exam question. So what we are seeing in front of us is a reaction, and we need to start by analyzing our reagents. We have a potassium cyanide, which is a good nucleophile. On top of that, we're seeing the six-membered ring with two leaving groups. Those both leaving groups, they are in the secondary position, which means that we are looking at the SN2 reaction. That means that we have two possible products over here. But here is the question which of these two products is going to be our major products? Well, since we are working with a six-membered ring, probably we need to search for our answer in the chair conformations. So, let's do the chair analysis. I'm going to start by drawing a stem for both of my chairs, for both flipped forms of that chair, and I'm going to add my groups to the first one, and likewise, I'm going to add my groups to the second one. I do have a dedicated tutorial on how to draw the chair conformations, Formations. So, if you guys need a refresher, go ahead and check that one out first, because we are going to be dealing with a lot of chairs in this video. Now, going back to my chair conformations that I have over here on the screen, the one on the left has two axial groups, and the one on the right has two equatorial groups. An important thing to notice here is that the conformation on the right is a more stable conformation, because this extremely bulky third butyl group that I have over here is in the equatorial position. So, here I have my two chairs. Well, so what? How is that going to help me answer which of the two possible products is my actual product. Well, since this is an SN2 reaction, let's take a step back and quickly review the important fact about the SN2 reaction and the fact that SN2 reactions require the backside attack. So, what the backside attack means is that when our nucleophile is attacking the carbon with our leaving group, that attack happens at 180 degrees to the bond with the leaving group. So, this angle over here is going to be 180 80 degrees. We have this requirement for this reaction because in order to kick away this leaving group over here, we need to supply the electron density onto the anti-bonding uh, sigma star orbital that is going to be at 180 degrees to our bonding orbital. Now, applying that to our chair conformations, let's compare two chairs. One, in which our leaving group is in the axial position, and the other one in which our leaving group is in the equatorial position. So, looking at my axial position, the anti-bonding orbital that we need to supply with electron density is sitting right over here at 180 degrees. So, if my nucleophile is coming in and trying to supply electron density onto this orbital, trying to attack this orbital, we're not going to see much of the uh, steric interactions. The R groups whatever these two R groups might be, they are kind of sitting parallel to the plane of the attack where the nucleophile is going to be coming from. However, if we look at the same sigma star orbital that we need to populate with electrons for the equatorial leaving group, well, in that case, we have a little bit of a problem. The nucleophile will have to fight these R groups that are standing in the way. So, in other words, you can think that the access to that sigma star is sort of like guarded by the axial groups in the ring itself, which means that that attack, when our leaving group is in equatorial position, is going to be extremely unfavorable. Thus, for the successful backside attack in the ring, the leaving group must be in the axial position, because only then the nucleophile can attack that antibonding orbital without any kind of steric hindrances and any kind of steric interactions that we don't want to see. Now, coming back to our original example and looking at our chairs from the original example, if we have a significant difference in the stability of our chair conformations, like in this case, the one on the right is going to be a significantly more stable chair, that means that the molecule is going to be spending most of its time, like in this case, 99.9% .9 of its time in this specific conformation. And here we have iodine that is axial. 
for this particular chair, the axial position for that iodine is going to be our reactive position, while the other iodine is going to be in the unreactive position, because in order to attack this carbon, we'd have to attack from essentially middle of the ring, while by attacking this carbon, we can do it from the side of the ring, the way I demonstrated in my previous screen and my previous slide. Which means that in this case, when my nuclear file comes in, it's not going to have any problems doing the attack, and that is going to give us major product looking like this. And of course, if we want to redraw that with dashes and wedges, that's going to be this product over here, where I'm substituting the one iodine that I used to have on the right side, and both iodine and the cyanide going to end up looking at me in the final products. Now, what about a question where we have two reactions and we are going to be comparing those two reactions? So, like in this case, I have two seemingly similar reactions, one with the leaving group looking away from us, another one with the leaving group looking at us, both reactions undergo the SN2 transformation with a very good nucleophile, sodium azide, and both reactions going to make the corresponding product where the bromine is replaced with our azide. Now, like in the previous case, here, for us to figure out which reaction is going to go faster, we are also going to do our chair analysis of the starting materials. So, for my molecule A, the most stable chair conformation for my starting material is going going to look like this. I'm not going to draw both chairs, I will just draw the major, uh, the more stable chair conformation, because that is the one that we are going to be seeing most of the time. And in this case, the bromine is equatorial. We know that if leaving group is equatorial, that is a problem. Looking at this equatorial group over here, we see that the backside attack is going to be, well, very difficult. Now, if we look at the chair conformation for the molecule B, well, in that case, my bromine is actually axial, and we know that if we have leaving group in the axial position, doing the backside attack is not going to be an issue, so when my nucleophile comes in and kicks that bromine out, the backside attack here is going to be super easy, meaning that in this case, reaction B is going to be faster. So here is a very common misconception that I hear over and over again from a lot of students. If something is more stable, that is going to be more reactive. Well, that is simply not true, because stability is an important factor in organic chemistry, of course, but you got to be very careful with what you're referring to. What is more stable? Is that the starting material? Is that the product? Whether it's even relevant or not? Like, in this particular case, when we're looking at our reaction here, Actually, the starting material for the reaction B is less stable and yet is more uh, reactive. So never make a blanket statement that just because something is more stable or the product is more stable, that reaction is going to be faster. There are many other factors that you need to take into consideration, especially for the stereochemistry sensitive reactions like SN2, let's say, you gotta take into consideration your steric factors and never just say that because something is more stable, that's going to be more reactive as a blanket statement. It just doesn't work this way. Now, another common question dealing with the axial reactivity is going to be E2 reactions in the chairs. And there we have the same principle as well. So let's say we have these couple of reactions. Both are going to give you the same set of the final products. We are going to get the alkene. The difference here is that in one case our bromine is looking in one direction, while in the other case our leaving group bromine is looking in the opposite direction. Well, in this case we are going to do the same analysis, we are going to look at our chairs again. In the first case, when I'm drawing the most stable conformation for my starting material A, I'm going to have this structure. In the second case for the reaction B, it's going to be a molecule that looks like this. Now, in the first case, my bromine is axial. In the second case, my bromine is equatorial. And we already know that if we have the axial position, it is going to be reactive in the substitution reactions. However, in the elimination reaction, we have a similar idea. The living group is going to be axial, and antiperiplanar hydrogens that we need for the E2 reaction here are also going to be axial. So that gives us a perfect orbital overlap, so it's going to work exactly the way we want. 
However, on the bottom, when the bromine is equatorial, well, substitution is impossible and we are not talking about substitution, but for the elimination, we do not even have suitable hydrogens. This bromine is antiperiplanar to these two carbons in the ring. And we know that for the E2 reaction, you got to have the antiperiplanar hydrogens and not some random carbons. So the elimination in the case of B is going to be virtually impossible. So this way, the first reaction now is going to be super fast, and the second reaction, well, let's say it's going to be extremely slow. So basically, what I want you to remember from this video is that when we're dealing with chair conformations, the leaving group must be axial for both SN2 and E2 reactions. And especially when it comes to the E2 reaction, it's not just the leaving group, but also your hydrogen on the adjacent carbon, on the beta carbon, that hydrogen also needs to be in the axial position. If in the chair you have your uh, leaving group axial, but you do not have axial hydrogens nearby, then the elimination will still not be possible. So remember, when it comes to our chairs, the axial position is the king of reactivity and not the equatorial position, although equatorial positions are more thermodynamically stable. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, make that thumbs up button go axial, subscribe for more organic chemistry content, check out this awesome video, and I'll see you next time.